Hebrews chapter 4, and we'll begin this morning in verse 14. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want to preach a message this morning entitled, The Confidence of God. The Confidence of God. Will you pray with me and pray for me this morning? Father, we thank You for Your Word. God, we thank You Lord, for the opportunity, God, to open Your Word. And we know that it is a living Word and it has the power, Lord, to change our lives, God, to change our hearts. And Lord, our prayer today is, God, that we wouldn't leave here like we came. Lord, that we would be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would receive this Word on good ground and it might produce faith. Lord, that it might produce fruit in our hearts, O God. Lord, today I pray that You would anoint the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of the Word of God. Lord, give us eyes to see what You're trying to show us. God, give us ears that can hear what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. And God, give us a heart that's been prepared by the Holy Spirit. It's been emptied of the things of this world that it might be filled with the precious promises of the living God. Lord, help us today, Lord. Do a work in these altars, Lord, when we come to seek You, when it's said and done, Lord. And we thank You in advance for what You're going to do today. In the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen. 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 Last Sunday... I preached a message that the Lord had given me entitled, Who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were naked? That was the question that God asked Adam and Eve in the garden when He came looking for them. And they had fallen into sin. They had been deceived by the devil. And when they heard God coming, they hid themselves. They covered themselves up with fig leaves. And God came looking for Adam. You can see the love of God that no matter how far you've ran, no matter how far you've gone, God's searching for you. God's calling you. God's inviting you to come home. Adam, where are you? Well, I'm hiding. I was afraid. I was naked, so I hid myself. And God said, who told you that you were naked? And we see the desire of the enemy is to cover men and women in shame so that they hide from God. The Lord spoke to me and told me that the shame of sin can be worse on a person than the act of sin. Because the act of sin, it may just endure for a moment. You steal something from somebody. That doesn't take very long. But to have to live the rest of your life knowing that you're a thief, People label you as a thief and you live under the fear and the condemnation of that. The enemy desires to cover people in shame. And then we find religion. Religion was in that garden. It's as old as man. They try to cover themselves up with fig leaves. Well, I've done wrong, so I'm going to try to make up for it. I haven't been doing right. I've been doing wrong, so now I want to start doing right to try to make up for the wrong that I've been doing. And that's what religion does. You just wear a mask and try to cover up what you really are. You just become an actor on a stage. You just go through a little bit of religion and you end up with plastic Christianity. Oh, we look good on the outside. We've got clothes set aside for Sunday morning clothes. You don't work cows and change the oil in them clothes. Those are Sunday morning clothes because I want to look good on Sunday morning. But on, in the midst of it all, folks, there's plenty of people. They look good on the outside on Sunday morning, but on the inside, they're left unchanged. They're left full of sin because all they got was religion. 
religion. Let me tell you, religion will not produce boldness or confidence to stand before God because just like Adam and Eve, they put them fig leaves on, but when they heard God coming, what did they do? They hid. Oh, I don't want you to see. He'll see right through your fig leaves. Let me tell you, you don't want to stand before God hoping that the good outweighs the bad in your life. Don't let the devil cover you with shame. Don't let religion cover you with fig leaves. Let God cover you in the righteousness of the Lamb. Let the blood of Jesus wash off of you every sin, every stain, every bit of guilt, all of the shame and you will have the confidence to stand before men and to stand before God. God's people have been held in shame for too long. In this place of shame, they can't worship God. That's why those churches are like funerals and everybody just sits there. They can't praise the Lord. Nobody can testify about what God is doing in their life because shame takes over them, held in shame, fear, and guilt. But do you know the answer for that shame is the perfect love of God that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18, there is no fear in love because fear has torment. I know people that have a call of God on their life, but they're scared to death of what people think about them. They're scared to death. What if I fail and the devil will hold you in fear all of your life? What if? What if? There's a demon behind every bush. Let me tell you what. The love of God casts out all fear. Fear. If I know that I'm right with Him, if I know that He loves me and He's smiling down on me, and no matter where He puts me, He didn't bring me here to fail. He didn't bring me here on these waves to sink. He brought me here to victory. And if I know that I'm right with God, I don't have to be afraid of you. I don't have to be afraid of any man. God's perfect love casts out all fear. If I'm right with God, I don't have to be afraid of anybody. The time is now for the sons of God to arise with confidence in God, to draw near in God, walk in that destiny, walk in the calling of God upon your life, and reap a harvest in this lost world. That's the need for this church in this hour, is to know who you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, the church needs that. Because if we're held in fear and in bondage and shame, we can't help that world out there. We've got nothing to offer them. Well, I guess you can come in here and sit down beside me and go to sleep on the pew beside me. We'll sing three hymns and then we'll go home. Do what, do the best we can till we come back and do it again. That's where the church has been for so long. You know what the world needs? Somebody to step out in the midst of it. Oh, I'm not the way, but I do know the way. Yes. His name is Jesus. Yes. I'm not a highly educated man, but I do know the answer to your problems. Yes. You won't find it at the liquor store. You won't find it on the corner. You won't find it in a bottle of prescription pills. You won't find it on the couch of a psychiatrist. You'll find it at the feet of Jesus. You'll find it on Calvary where the Son of God bore your sin, your shame, and your sorrow. And He bled and He died. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. But three days later, the stone rolled away and He walked out. And today, if you could see past through these ceilings and clouds, you would see at the right hand of the Father, there is a Lamb that has been slain. And the Bible says He ever lives to make intercession for us. If you can see in the heaven, there's people. They've been the worst of the worst, the lowest of the lowest. But their song is, I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And heaven's testimony is, the blood of Jesus has brought me here, saved me from what I am, what I was, and made me what I am today. The church needs to know 
Stop living in shame. Stop living in fear. You need to know the value of the blood of Jesus. That it's not about you. Stop having a pity party. Stop riding that roller coaster. You're up on Sunday, but you're down again by Tuesday night. Walk with God. Be stepping higher. You can. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He don't change His mind about you from Sunday to Monday. He loves you. He smiled upon you. He's brought you into a place where you are blessed and highly favored by the Lord and He has forgotten your sins, wrote His Word in your heart, His laws into your mind. And if you want to, you can walk with Him. His grace will be sufficient for you in every time of your life. Develop intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, we'll look at it in a minute, but it's the Spirit of God that bears witness with our spirit yes. that we are the sons of God. Yes. Isn't it amazing, yes. Brother Robert? People will listen to the opinions of men. They said something ugly about me. Now, just all booger face because somebody don't like me. You better join the club. going to be a lot of people that don't like you. Jesus said that servant's not above that Lord. You look at what they did to Him. Don't expect this world. Let me tell you what, this world had not got sanctified now that Jesus has gone to heaven. The same Antichrist, God-hating Spirit that crucified Christ is alive in the United States of America. You better get used to it. They ain't going to like you. They ain't going to roll out the red carpet for you. But you need to know who you are in Christ instead of listening to the opinion of men. Get intimate with the Holy Spirit and He will testify to your spirit. You are my Son. I have adopted you. You're a joint heir with Christ. You're a part owner of the kingdom of God. God will supply all of your needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Stop listening to the lies of the devil. Hear the I believe God talks to men. He talks to me. Yeah. I like the way he talks. <laughs> I want to hear him. Know the value that God has put upon the blood of Jesus. And let me tell you what the church needs to know this. You parents need to know this to walk with God. Because too much, guys, you see it everywhere. Parents are too caught up in their own problems. The parents don't know who they are. Just trying to find some peace. Just trying to find out, well, I don't know what I want. And in the midst of that, folks, the devil is having his way with those children. Yeah. You don't know who you are. Your kids going to grow up. They don't know who they are. But instead, folks, you can find an identity in Christ. I'm not looking to fit in this world. I don't care what the latest trend is. I don't care what's popular. I know what's popular with God. Yeah. His Word, washed in the blood, doing the will of God. That's what I'm caught up in. Don't care what's going on on this month. It's all going to end up in a lake of fire one day. I'm going to walk on streets of gold. I'm going to breathe the air of angels. I'm going to spend eternity in the presence of the living God. That's who I am. Because of Jesus, I know who I am. I'm a child of God. My name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. Because of Jesus, I know what I'm doing. Not like i got everything figured out, but I do know what my purpose on this earth is. I told my wife, I'm living in the most exciting time of my life right now. Right now. I'm seeing God. I'm literally seeing dreams that I've had in my bed at night. I'm living in one right now today. Standing in the midst of this church, I'm literally living a dream that I've had a few years ago. That building down the street, I was in an altar. We were in, in uh, Pottsville, Arkansas. There was a man preaching about the course of the world and how it's just like a, the current in a river. And people get close to that river, they're curious about it. And they get a foot in, before you know, they slide in. And the current of hell is carrying them all the way to the pits of hell. The current of the world is carrying them to the pits of hell. And they're trying to get out they're reaching for things. They're reaching for the things of this world. They're reaching for religious people. Some of them have reached into church, but that church didn't have it. 
But I saw, I saw in my heart, in my mind, that God had given us, folks, an anointing to be able to walk on the course of this world and say, if you want out, we'll help you out. If you want up, we'll help you out. We're not being pulled down in the current, but we are raising you up. I saw it. It was on Adams Avenue. I didn't even know that was called Adams Avenue at the time. But God has given us, folks, that anointing to preach the Gospel that's going to draw men out of Adam yeah. and place them into the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. We're going to see it, folks. I'm talking about entire families. Yes. Grandma and granddaddy, mom and daddy, maybe all of them are on their way to hell, but somebody might be a little boy that got a Bible at school going to come looking for that living water. And one by one, they're going to trickle in. They're going to find who they are in Christ. Because of Jesus, I know who I am. I know what I'm doing and I know where I'm going, right? It doesn't matter. They may take my life for this gospel one day, but I can tell you what, before the blood stops dripping off of that axe, I'll be in the presence of the Lord. And that's where I'll always be. That's what we need, folks, in this hour. Determination and confidence in God that He's not going to fail us. The scripture that we read, Hebrews chapter 4. It's really a warning. The whole chapter is really a warning not to fall in the same manner as the Israelites fell. The Israelites had a real identity of God. They were the one people on the face of the earth that were ordained by God. God called Abraham, and through the lineage of Abraham, God birthed a multitude of people there in Egypt. They also had a calling. They had a destiny. Where are they going? They're going to the promised land. And God was going to pour out His blessings upon this nation so that the whole world would know the true living God is the God of Israel. But they failed to walk in that identity. They failed time and time again. They went worshiping other gods as soon as they got the chance. They didn't want God to lead them. Make us a king so that we can be like everybody else. We want what everybody else has instead of what God has given us. We can, and, and the warning to the church is, don't fail like they fail. Let me tell you something, guys. I believe that every person, I believe it was Kyle opened this morning that we're not here by accident. Right. Nobody's an accident. Right. I believe what God said to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were in your mama's womb. I knew you. And I called you and I had a plan for your life. I believe that could be said and it is true over every man, woman, boy, and girl on this earth. But let me tell you, the call of God is not an automatic thing. You have to embrace it. You have to walk in it. And we as the church, we can fail. I believe y'all. By and large, the church in America has failed this nation. That's why we got into the place that we're in. We're divided. We're full of hate. We're full of bitterness. Everybody says there's a Christ, they're a Christian, but there's very little evidence, very little fruit in this land. The failure that they made, y'all, was that they would not enter into God's rest. If you look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2, the Bible says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. The Bible says they heard the same gospel that we, they heard the word of God, but it didn't profit them. That means it wasn't useful. It, it didn't make them better off. It gave them no advantage. Why? Because it wasn't mixed with faith in the people that heard it. Just think about it. They saw the evidence of God being in their midst day after day after day. Manna on the ground. A rock following them around in the wilderness. Every provision. Everything they needed. Water gushing out of that smitten rock. All that they needed was being provided by the hand of God. But they still did not believe. They had no, no faith. And because they had no faith, they were found in fear. 
Where there is no faith, there will always be fear. I'm afraid. Well, if you're afraid to do it, it's because you don't have faith that God's going to uphold you and that God's going to keep you. You have more faith in the enemy's ability to harm you and to discourage you and defeat you than you do in the ability of God to keep you and to help you succeed and make it through to the other side. Where there is no faith, there's always going to be fear. They got right to the border of the promised land and wouldn't go in. How many times, y'all, do you think maybe God brought us right to the border yeah. of the promise? Walking in the fullness of Christ. God had something more that He wanted to give you. But you're still holding on to yesterday. We get comfortable in yesterday. This is what I've always done. This is the way it's always... I don't know if I step out there, I might, I might sink. And God brings us right to the edge of promise after promise, but we let fear keep us out. But on into the fourth chapter of Hebrews, the attention is placed on one the Bible says is a great heavenly high priest. His name is Jesus. The, the admonishment is this. Get your eyes off your problems and fix your eyes on the great heavenly high priest who is passed into heaven, Jesus, the Son of the living God. Because if you look at Him, your faith is going to be built and your fear is going to leave. And this is the, this is the progression of the, of the high priest. It says that he's entered into the heavens in the tabernacle of Moses. A man would come. God says if it's, if, it's, if it's in a man's heart of his own will, if that man would acknowledge to God that he sinned and he's not right with God, he can meet me at the door of the tabernacle and he has to bring a lamb from the flock, a lamb without blemish. That lamb is going to be the substitute for his sins. That man would lay his hand on the head, the brow of that animal. And in the mind of God, God's economy, that man's sin would be transferred to this animal. And the righteousness of the Lamb would be placed upon the man. But somebody's got to pay for the sin of the man. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So that man would take a knife from the priest and right there at the door of that tabernacle cuts that lamb's throat. That blood is poured out into a basin. The priest catches the blood in the basin. Now the offering has been accepted. The man gets to go home. I'm forgiven. I'm free. When he goes home, it ain't going to be about how good I am or how I always get everything right. It's going to be thank you God for the Lamb. Thank you God for the blood. Thank you God that there was somebody that took my place. But that little Lamb don't go home. He's handed into the arms of the priest. They rip the hide off of him. They pull his insides out. They're looking, is anything wrong with it? Because if anything's wrong with this lamb, we got to do it all over again because God won't accept it. They searched Him inside and out. That's what the 33 years of righteousness was about. Jesus was examined by God, by men, and by the devil. No fault in Him. The wicked would come, but He found nothing in me. Then this little lamb, y'all, is thrown upon the altar. The brazen altar fire would fall from heaven and burn this little lamb. It would roast it. That was God's approval of the sacrifice. That was God's judgment falling upon that little lamb. And then that priest would take that blood. He passes through the outer court. There's limited access here, but there's still some there. Then he would go through the inner court. And then he would come to a veil. So thick, so dark. One man said, 12 yoke of oxen couldn't rip this veil in half. This veil wasn't to hide God. It was to protect man from the presence of God. Because if a man got in God's presence, 
and he's in his sins, he would fall dead. But that high priest would make his way through that curtain. Now, he's in a place where only he can go. Ordinary man would never make it there. There would never be any hope of me and you making it there. But there's that great high priest. He can go there. He's been set apart for this. He's been ordained. He's been called for this. And inside this little place called the Holy of Holies is a box of furniture called the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe it looked kind of like this table. It's made out of one piece of solid gold. On each side, there's two angelic beings with their wings spread out. And they're sitting up on top of this. Inside of this box is the stone commandments that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. And these two cherubim are looking down on the law. It's a picture of God looking at man saying, you're guilty! 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 And judgment is going to fall upon you. It's a picture of God's holiness. And because of that, man deserves the wrath of God. Because there's not a one of us in here that's not guilty of breaking God's holy commandment. But that high priest would go in. On top of this box, there's a little lid, a rim all the way around it. He's got the blood of the Lamb. A Lamb without spot. A Lamb without blemish. He made His way into the Holy of Holies. And He takes that blood and He pours it out on what's called the mercy seat. So now... The judgment of God is not looking upon broken commandments. It's looking at the blood. And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. This is our confidence, folks. This is the confidence of the people. Not that I've done everything right. Not not that I've kept God's commandments. Not that I've been good enough or I haven't been too bad. But my confidence is the Lamb was slain for me and the blood of Jesus was shed for me to wash away my sins and to give me a confidence to approach the throne of God that I'm not in my shame anymore and I'm not subject to the wrath of God any longer. This man though, this man Jesus... He didn't go into an earthly tabernacle. He went, the Bible says, this man passed into the heavens. Oh, what a precious thing it must have been to that sin in Israelite to have a high priest that could represent him in the presence of God. But how much more, folks, me and you have a great heavenly high priest who has passed into the heavens and he presented his blood to the heavenly mercy seat to represent us there. That is our confidence. That is our boldness in him. We can draw near to God. Because of Him. Flip over a page or two to Hebrews chapter 10. This is what we were reading this morning. Hebrews chapter 10 and this verse 16. It says, this is the covenant. This covenant means an agreement that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put My law where? Anybody reading with me? We're in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. Going to put my law where? Into their heart. Moses' stone commandments were only on the outside to tell you what to do, what not to do. But God said He's going to give you a new covenant and He's going to put His law in your hearts and in your mind. You know what that's going to result in? A changed lifestyle. You won't have Moses following you around saying, do this, don't do that. You'll have the inner witness of the Holy Ghost. He'll keep you out of trouble and He'll keep you in the will of God. So it won't be a preacher following you around. Don't say that. Don't go there. Don't talk like that. Don't act like that. No, it'll be the voice of the Holy Spirit and He will deal with you. I've given this example many times. I'll just share it with you again so you can get a picture of what it looks like. Several years ago, my wife and my family, we went to the mall in Tupelo. I hate going to the mall, right? That, that's, I guess, men. Women shop different than men, right? I know what I want. I ain't going to look at the price, just going to get it, and I'm going to get out of there. Women go in, look all day, may or may not buy anything, you know? 
we had been at the mall and I'd been trying to wrangle those kids and I did try to give my wife a little bit of time to shop and we got back and she ain't bought nothing. So it just exploded right there. Where were we? Dillard's <laughs> Belk. Right in Belk. So we drive back all the way from Tupelo. I ain't saying nothing. She ain't saying nothing. Well, I'm right. She's wrong. She can apologize if she's thinking the same thing, right? When we get home, I realized I left the lawnmower outside and it was fisting the rain, so I went to pull that, put that lawnmower in the shed. While I'm in that shed, that law in my heart, the Holy Spirit shows up. And He said to me, Brother Robert, that ain't how we act in this family. You ain't going to talk to her like that in this family. And I said, yes, sir. Yes, Lord. Forgive me. I walked back up to that house, my heart in my hand, crying like a baby. Asked her to forgive me for the way I acted and what I did. No stone commandment did that. That's the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. There's been a lot of times since then just like that. The Holy Spirit will deal with you about how you treat people, about what you do, about what you say. It ain't about you being right. It's about Jesus being lifted up in in your heart and in your home and in your marriage. So the Bible says, verse 17, he says, your sins and iniquities I'll remember no more. They're not going to be looming over your head. He's going to forget them. The Bible says in verse 19, listen to this, y'all. Having therefore, brethren, boldness. That word boldness, it means free and fearless confidence. That's where I got the title for this message. The confidence of God. Free and fearless confidence to enter in the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus. Not by your righteousness. Not by your works. Not according to where you've been and how good you've done. But the righteousness of the Lamb. The blood that was shed for you. It gives you access to enter in to the holiest of all. Y'all, it's real practical. I'm talking about worshiping Him. I'm talking about being used by Him. I'm talking about praising Him and having a testimony of life in your heart and in your life and in your home. You've got boldness. To enter into the presence of God by the blood of Jesus. Look in verse 20. By a new and living way. Not an old dead way, but a new and living way which Jesus made for us. Look, through the veil. On the other side of that veil. Not out here playing religion. Not out here, well, I know they're all the, the good man upstairs. Right? That's what pe- some people say. The good man upstairs, no, that ain't going to get it. That, that ain't going to cut it. You got that old dead way you heard your grandpa talk about. I'm talking about a new and living way. His name is Jesus. Yes. He lives inside of us. Jesus. He's leading us. His Spirit is talking to us. What you mean? Yeah, I'm talking about a new and living way. Amen. Not a stale, crusty religion. I'm talking about a new living way where He speaks to us. He leads us. He guides us. He makes provision for us. There's a real testimony of life of what He's done in my life and in my family and in my church lately. That's a new living way. Through that veil, that veil the Bible says was His flesh that was torn for us. Look at here, verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God... Let us draw near with a true heart. You know what a true heart is? A heart that is fully confident in the way that God has made for us to get into the presence of God. It's a heart that is set upon Jesus. 
A heart that says, I'm not going to live this life based upon my own ability. I'm not going to let the fear of, well, I might fail, or the fear or the shame of, I failed this time last year. But it's a heart with its all of its confidence in Jesus that though I may fail, He is not going to fail. And I'm not going to tremble in the fear of the accusations of the enemy. I'm going to draw near to God with a true heart. The Bible says that our, our, our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience. That means the guilt. That means the shame. That means the fear of yesterday. That means I really don't belong here. That means every time I want to draw near, something always pulls me back. No, the Bible says that blood has washed our hearts from an evil conscience. I've forgotten about it. People might bring it up. But I tell you what, God says your sins, your iniquities, I will remember no more. The Bible says our bodies washed with pure water. Do you know many times in the Bible, the water is symbolic of the Word. By the renewing of the Spirit and the washing of the water of the Word. That Word is cleaning up our life. That Word is teaching us how to live. In many of us, in all of us, to some degree, there's a struggle going on because we're learning to live a new life. That Word is a road map. It'll clean your life up. But you have to stay in it. You have to let your heart be settled on Christ. Don't let the enemy take you out. Because I'm telling you folks, he will come with his accusations and his lies. He'll come to bring division. He'll try to set you against me. He'll try to get you to misinterpret some of the things that I say to you. He'll try to plant seeds of doubt and discord in your heart and in your mind. What's it going to take to stay in this and to be a part of it? A true heart. Full assurance of faith. My heart has been washed of an evil conscience. I'm not suspicious of you. I'm not looking for the worst in you. I'm trying to see Christ in you. I'm trying to encourage you because I want you to make it as bad as I want to make it. And we have a destiny. We have a call of God. There's a mantle across our shoulders. We cannot afford to fail in what God has called us to do. We are soldiers in an army. We're here in a time of war to do spiritual warfare in the kingdom of God over this nation. Not for money, houses, and land, but for souls that are going to spend eternity somewhere. Let's populate heaven with souls that have been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, let us draw near, folks. Let us draw near to God God. with a true heart. Not divided. There's been times my heart has been divided. Oh, I wanted Jesus, but Brother Robert, I want something out there in the world. But every time I've went and pursued that world, it left me broken. It left me hurt. It left me full of remorse. It left me full of regret. And I've lived long enough to know there's nothing for me out in that world. I will glory in this cross where I've been crucified to that world and that world is crucified to me. And I know that I'm just passing through. I'm not a citizen of this land. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm looking for a city that has foundations whose builder and maker is God. Oh, hallelujah. He entered in first and He poured the blood on heaven's mercy seat. Then He tore the veil that kept us out. That's the first thing God did when Jesus gave His life on the cross. He ripped that veil that kept men out of the presence of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that welcomes us in. Come inside this veil. Come and see what's behind the curtain. Don't settle for that old dead way. Get on that new living way. Get on the other side of that veil. You know what that is? That's not a plastic show in church. That's Monday evening on your way home from work. You might be behind the wheel on I-55. But I can tell you what, if they could see in the Spirit, you're on the other side of that veil. You're coming boldly, not just to a mercy seat, y'all, but a throne of grace. Come, how boldly, 
to a throne of grace. You can't come up there timidly. You got to come boldly, not arrogantly, but confident in the way that God has made. I'm coming to that throne of grace, and He's not going to tell me no. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Just to share you with you a testimony. Just a few months ago, it's at the end of last year. We're barely getting by, barely eking along, robbing Peter to pay Paul. God started ministering to my heart from Psalms chapter 1 that I'm going to make you like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You'll, your leaf won't wither. You're going to bear fruit. Whatever you do will prosper. And, and I told my boys, this was one night, I think it was on a Tuesday night, we were riding through. I could show you right where we are. We were riding in Little Whitey. I told my boys, I said, I said listen boys, the Lord has revealed to my heart that He wants to prosper us. No more getting by. No more inking along. No more just existing. That's what I said. God didn't call us just to exist. The Bible says those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of their God. Not just ink along. Not just scratch out a miserable existence. But God said to me, I want to prosper you. I'm just asking you to believe me. I said right now, boys, let's pray that God's going to do this. Later on that afternoon, I was walking in Dollar General. My phone rang. I thought it was some telemarketer. Didn't answer it. I got back out to the truck. A voicemail. man called me. Wants, wants, wants me to come. Move some dirt for him. A little bit of job turned into a little bigger job. Met with them last week looking at possibly having the best year I've ever had. That's what God does. That's the way God moves. That's a real testimony. Really happened in my life. Really happened just a few months ago. Come to that throne of grace. I believe, y'all, if it matters to you, it matters to God. Come. Whatever the need that you have, I can tell you what, that's what we have in heaven, y'all. We have a good Father that He don't want to just get your hopes up and let you down. He wants to build faith in your life. And as you stand still and see the salvation of the Lord after door, after door, after door opens for you as the devil shoots his fiery darts and they just miss you on the right hand and on the left. That's the favor of God. That is confidence in God. That he didn't bring you here to fail. Is it all right? Y'all okay? If I talk about how God blessing me, y'all looking at me like a jealous stepchild. I'm just telling you, you can have it too. I don't say things to brag, I say things to stand and say, if God did it for me, he will do it for you. I know what it's like all too well to not have enough. I know what it's like to ask for an extension on that loan. I know what it's like to want to hide my phone and answer it because I don't have the money to pay the bills that are coming into my mailbox. But I'm telling you what, God has better for us than that in Christ Jesus. God's able to provide. King David said, I've been young, now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or His seed begging for bread. I want you to be, folks, Confident in God. Confident in the ability of God to make a way for you. You see, if you're covered in shame and guilt, you ain't never going to ask God for anything. Why? Because you don't, you, you don't deserve it. Oh, I don't. That's what that prodigal boy thought coming home. I'm not going to ask to be a son. I just want to be a servant. And I'll, bre- I'll beg for my bread and I'll sleep in the barn. The father didn't even listen to that. No, you're my son. I'm going to close. God always has more. He just needs you to believe in more. Too many Christians walk in a spirit of shame and rejection. That's the spirit of a slave. But the Bible says that God has called us to walk in the spirit of sonship. I want you to turn one more time. Romans chapter 8 and verse 15. Listen to this, y'all. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption 
whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. In verse 15 it says, you did not receive the spirit of bondage that brings fear. Look in these words up. The spirit of bondage literally means the spirit of a slave. The spirit of a slave. Too many Christians, they're caught in that old dead way and the spirit on them. It's not the spirit of adoption. It's the spirit of a slave. Let me tell you, the spirit of a slave sinks in the middle of a trial. Adversity hits you, all the air is just let out of your lungs. Why? Just imagine that slave. There's no help for me. Nobody's coming for me. My life doesn't matter to anybody. I'm all on my own. Just however it comes, that's just the way it's going to be. It's the way it always goes in my life. Nothing ever good happens in my life. You hear people say that about themselves. Well, the way my luck is. It's the spirit of a slave. You're not expecting anything good for you. It's a spirit that's full of fear. It's void of faith. And at the sight of trouble... You can tell many Christians have the spirit of a slave because at the sight of trouble, they think God's mad at them. Oh, God's done changed His mind about me. I must have done something wrong. And what you have is the spirit of bondage that brings fear. There's no joy in serving God. You don't know the joy of the Lord. All you know is religion. And yeah, put on an act to make people think that you're happy. You may sing the songs about God, but there's no real freedom in your heart because you don't really believe that God loves you and that God has accepted you. I want you to think for a moment about the parable of the talents. One man got five talents. Another man got two. They walked in faith They walked in love and they know I've received these good gifts from my Father and they just went out and used what God had given them and the Lord just kept adding to their life. You know what they saw, Brother Robert? Door after door after door after door. I open doors no man can shut. I close doors no man can open. God's shining on them as bright as the sunlight. Oh, the devil come and he tried to rob those five talents but instead God gave them five more. And they were standing there at the end, Lord, what You gave me, it's doubled. It's increased in my life. Because they were great? No, because what God had given them was great. They valued what God gave them. Then one got one talent. The difference is he allowed the spirit of a slave to get on him. He didn't walk in faith. He walked in fear. He didn't walk in love. He walked in a spirit of shame and regret and and rejection. Well, I don't have as much as Jeremy Kilgore has, so God must not love me. So now I'm embarrassed. I'm not going to show my one because he's got five. I don't belong with them anymore. So now you isolate yourself, you hide, you're covered in shame, and day after day after day, you've become the devil's little plaything, and he's toying with you, he's playing cat and mouse with you, he's poisoning your mind, he's poisoning your heart, and you have that spirit of a slave, and you bury everything that God has given you. Let me tell you, you did not receive the spirit of bondage that brings fear. That's that old way. That's that old religious way. But you have been brought into a new living way. Get on the other side of that veil. Who knows if you walk with one. It's, I can tell you what, that one was made of the same thing that the five were made yes, out of. Yes, yes. And they all come from the same place, Les. It come from heaven. It's got to be valuable. I can tell you what, no made in China stamped on this one, Nathan. No, sir. And who knows, a man got one. 
Meet some faith with it. Walk in the love of God. I'm not ashamed. You might have five. I got one. But I tell you what, my father gave me this one. But keep your eye on me. Because next year I'm going to have two. (laughs) Three years from now I might have ten, Brother Robert. Because let me tell you what, folks. Mix it with faith. Believe God. Believe God and walk in it. You did not receive the spirit of bondage and fear. But look at this. But you have received. That word received in the Greek is the word lambano. And it means to lay hold of something. Not just an automatic deal. You've got to lay hold of it. You can lay hold to the spirit of a slave. And that's just got me. And I'm always going to be let go of it. <laughs> Grab hold right here. The spirit of adoption. Look, literally that means the spirit of sonship. The spirit of sonship. Not the spirit of a slave. There's no fear in this son's heart. The spirit of a son. The spirit of sonship. Where the spirit of a slave, if things don't go right for him, well now God don't love me and I might as well run off. But the spirit of a son rises in adversity. I want you to think about this. Joseph in that pit. He's got promises from God, but people treat him bad. His brothers sell him, put him down in the pit. He ends up going to Egypt. They treat him bad, put him in the pit. All and all along. But he did not allow being in that prison, being in that pit, to rob the dream that God had put inside of his heart. All the while, I know who I am. You know what? He could have allowed what people done to shape his life. He could have been the lowest of the low in Egypt. He didn't owe them anything. He could have been the drinking, the smoking, the drug addict, the fornicator, the adulterer, the thief. Well, they did it to me. I'm going to do it to them. Too often people allow what others did to them to shape who they are. But instead, he stayed true to God. He knew who he was. And the spirit of a son rose in the midst of adversity. He became the mightiest man on the face of the earth. And God gave him the opportunity to do good to the ones that did evil to him. Think about David. David's spirit rose in the face of adversity. He's out there taking care of them sheep. Here comes the lion. Been about time to go to the house, you know. But he ran to that lion. A little bit later, he ran to a bear. He killed a lion and a bear. Another day, all the soldiers of Israel scared to death of a nine foot tall giant named Goliath. But the spirit of a who is this going to defy the name of my God? And the Bible says with a sling in his hand, David ran to the face of that giant and he walked off with victory. Victory. All of it. The spirit of sonship. Paul and Silas in a Philippian prison at midnight. Their backs bleeding. I ain't never been there, but I have had things that I wanted I thought were going to turn out good didn't turn out so good. And I didn't act like Peter, uh, Paul and Silas. Whine and pout. I'm supposed to be a servant of God. I thought God led me here. Now here I am whipped down, chained up in prison. Thought I was going to have revival. It couldn't get any worse than this. That ain't what they did at midnight. The Bible says they begin to sing praises to God. You know what happened? The spirit of sonship rose up in them in the midst of adversity. They begin to sing the praises of God. At midnight, Richard, when it didn't look good, when the sun wasn't shining, there wasn't a nice pretty crowd for them to preach to and a nice powerful altar call. All the world's fingers were pointing to them. But at midnight, they began to sing the praises of God and every chain fell off and every prisoner was loose and the man that put him in jail got saved in his whole house. Oh, folks, that's what we need is the spirit of sonship that when it gets bad in these last days, we don't go down, but we're drawing near to God with a true heart, full assurance of faith. Our bodies washed with pure water and our hearts sprinkled from 
an evil conscience. Oh, folks, I'm going to start wrapping up with this. The spirit of adoption. I want you to think for a moment about children that nobody wants. They're orphans. They're abandoned. So sad. Nobody wants us. We don't have anybody. Jesus wants them. And the devil's told some of you the same thing. Nobody wants you. Nobody loves you. Nobody could ever love you. Oh, if they only knew you, nobody could ever love you. People have rejected me all my life. I've never had a lot of friends. I've never been popular. I've never had a group or a crowd around me. Sometimes I can be in the middle of a big crowd and still feel alone. That's the spirit of shame. That's the spirit of rejection. That's what the devil tries to pile on people. Let me tell you what. Jesus does love you. This church does love you. You're the one I've been praying for. You're where I've been looking for. The one nobody else loved. Just give us an opportunity to love you with the love of God. Let the love of God pour into your heart. And it won't matter what them people said about you. It won't matter the fiery darts the enemy shoots at you. Every single one one of them will fall to the ground. Children nobody wants. They believe that. They say that. Nobody wants us. Then the spirit of shame and rejection comes and gets on them. Other people have a family. Other people have somebody to love them. But not us. Until one day, somebody comes along that's a little bit different than the rest. Their heart's a little bit bigger than the rest. And they come and take those children that nobody else wants and said, come on, we're going home. You're going to be a part of our family. Whatever it costs, I'm going to get you out of here. No matter the price, I'm willing to pay. And imagine these children that nobody wants. Now somebody wants them. Where are you going? I'm going home. Never had a home before. Well, now you do. Imagine they get brand new clothes. Brand new clothes on. They get a room we've never had our own room for. Now you do. What's all this stuff in this room? That's your stuff. We bought it for you. You just enjoy it. Guess what? We're going out to get ice cream and a little ice cream. I've never had ice cream before. I've never had a family before. A family that would love them. A family that would spend time with them. A family that would teach them things. Now they're going to have a father. Now they're going to have a provider. Now they're going to have a protector. Let me tell you what, folks. That is an exact picture of what God has done for us in Christ. Walking around in a spirit of shame and rejection. Nobody could ever love me. Jesus said, oh, I can love you. I do love you. And I went all the way to Calvary to prove my love for you. Whatever the price is, I'm going to get you out of here. He paid a price. Kevin, not silver, not gold, but He shed His precious life's blood to get us out of the wrong family and to bring us in to the real family of God. Let me tell you folks, there is a family that sleeps in peace at night. There is a family that is full of love. There is a family that will protect you. There is a family that will provide for you. There is a family that don't stab each other in the back. That is the family of God. And this is the invitation. You can be a part of this family. This family of God. Walk in the spirit of adoption. Walk in the confidence of God. That's what you are, folks. Joint heirs with Christ. Not to eat the crumbs that fall from the table, but take your seat at that table. 
You know what that means? God, I want everything that You have for me in Christ. I'm coming to that table with all the confidence in God. I want to know what Your will is for my life. I want Your best for my life. I want Your best for these two boys and that little girl. I want Your best for my wife, for our marriage. I want Your best for this church and for the people that I rub shoulders with. I want to see people walk in the favor of God. God. Unemployment might be on the way way up, but I can tell you what, God can give you a job. There's a better job for you in Christ. There's a better home. There's a better marriage. There's a better family. But you've got to stop walking. And that spirit of shame, and that spirit of rejection, walk like a son and a daughter of God. Let me tell you what, folks, that will give you the confidence to stand boldly in this hour against the spirit of Antichrist that's out there in that world, and it is rising. Stand boldly against the pull and the attraction of the world because I know the truth about it. It doesn't matter. Whatever they come out with, it glitters, it shimmers, it attracts people, but it's nothing but a web of deceit to draw people into. One day it's all going to find its place in a lake of fire. But spend your time, spend your life building on the solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your treasure in heaven above where thieves don't break in and steal. Moths don't get there and destroy it. Dust is not able to get there and and corrupt it and decay it. Walk with God. I'm telling you folks, there's a free life. Free of shame. Free of, of that rejection. Free of that, rebi- of that bitterness. But there's a life full of love. A life, listen, you're able, God will plant your feet on this solid rock and from that platform of victory, you're able to reach and help other people. There's people on your job so depressed so discouraged. Their life is a revolving door. Go to work, get drunk, go home and fight. Day after day after day. The answer is inside of you. You're just too afraid to let it come out of your mouth. Let me tell you what. Today is the day. Get full of faith. Get full of the Holy Spirit. Show up there Monday morning and be a testimony of what God has done in your heart and in your life. I've been right there, but I don't live there anymore. I walk, I live as a son of the living God. There's peace at my house. We love each other at our house. We encourage each other at our house. I lay down and I sleep good at night. I used to lay awake 3 o'clock in the morning, things worrying and plaguing my mind. I can lay down and go to bed now. That's the peace of God. That i got more going on right now than I've ever had. I can lay down and go to bed at night. That's the peace of God that passes all understanding. People in your home plagued with problems. Kids in your home, they're, they're being pulled right now. They're young. They're young teenagers. They're in the, their friends are going the wrong way. You're wrestling with yourself. You're trying to find out who you are. You're drowning on your own and you're not able to help them. Today is the day. Build that life on this solid rock. Be a witness in your home. My family's not going to hell and the devil's not getting in my house. I'm going to stand at the door. I will protect them. I will provide for them. I will pour the Word of the living God. I will be a hedge around my family. And this church, y'all, going to stand in this community. You may be sour this morning. I don't know why. But I'm telling you what, you can find the joy of God. You can find the joy of the Lord and it will flow over your heart. If it seems like I'm bragging to you, I'm not. I'm just here to exhort you and stir you up in the faith of what I believe God wants to do in your heart and in your life. You can be, you can walk in the spirit of sonship, and you can see that door after door after door. Or you can be that Israelite. He wouldn't mix it with faith. So you know what he got to do? Forty years going nowhere. Boy, I'd get tired of that. Going nowhere. Year after year after year. You know what, y'all? It takes faith. Walk across that Jordan. 
go into the promised land. There are giants there. There's every attack of the enemy because he don't want you to have what God wants you to have. He wants there to be misery in your family. He wants you to go to a weak, watered-down church where you, you just sit on a pew and you never do anything for God. He wants you to be a chameleon on your job. You fit in with every little crowd there. I can tell you what, y'all, God has better than that for you. You can stand as a son, as a daughter of the Most High God, washed in the blood, filled with the Spirit. Your mind has been renewed by the Spirit of the living God. And it's the Good Shepherd. He's leading your life. He's setting the table. He's protecting you. Where am I going? I'm going for green pastures. I'm going for still waters. And the best ain't behind me somewhere. The best is just up around the corner. It takes faith to see that. And it takes faith to believe that. I want you to stand with me this morning. Father, we thank You for Your Word. God, we thank You for Your promises in Your Word. God, You never intended for people, you know, just to pray a prayer and never really know You spend their life outside of that veil. But You've invited Your people into life and life more abundant. Lord, You've invited us, Lord, to a a life full of love, a life full of grace, a life full of Your provision and communion and fellowship with You. Lord, I can see how shame and fear would keep us on the outside. But Lord, I pray today, God, You would send Your Spirit, Lord, to cry, to pour into, to speak to our spirit. Oh, Abba, Father, that there's no shame when those children call upon their Father. Because that's what He's there for. He's there to provide. He's there to protect. He's there to comfort. He's there to keep them. He's there to meet their needs. Lord, I'm praying today, Lord, right now in this moment, Lord, those here, God, covered, Covered, Lord, by that shame. Covered by the spirit of bondage and fear. The spirit of a slave. Lord, we lay that down right here today. No more. No more fear. No more bondage. No more shame. Going to walk as a son of God. Going to walk as a daughter of the Most High God. Going to walk in what He's called me into. Gonna walk in His love. Gonna know who I am. I'm gonna let Him define my life. Not my sin. Not my shame. Not the mess ups in the past. I'm gonna put them under the blood. And He promised, I read it in His Word. He'll remember it no more. And He's gonna plant my feet on a solid rock. For there, from there, I'm gonna help my children. I'm going to help my wife or my husband or my grandchildren. I'm going to be a witness on my job. I'm going to know who I am. Father, we thank You, Lord. Thank You, Holy Spirit, Lord, moving right now. Lord, I pray that You would draw us today, God. Lord, that we would hear that invitation that You give us, Lord, to come to intimacy with You, God. Oh, Lord, to let You speak to us. Lord, to speak to our spirits today. Oh, that we might walk in Your fullness, God. That we might know for the vast vast measure of goodness, Lord, that You desire to pour out upon each and every one of our lives. Oh, God.